Okay, well, thank you very much, Howard, for agreeing to do this interview. So today we're going to talk about orcas in the wild and orcas in captivity and how it affects them. Places like SeaWorld and Marineland sort of make the public believe that the orcas are happy in captivity as well as the other animals and that they're healthy and they do natural things. Several points for me that stick out from SeaWorld in particular that they try and reassure the public about are the age that the orcas live to, their dental conditions, their breeding, how, what time they spend with their young, the distances they swim and how they feed and their behaviours. Could you answer a few of these points talking about wild free orcas, you know, about their natural behaviours and the connections with their family and young for me? Right. Whenever I think about these questions about contrasting the lives of captive orcas with orcas in the wild, I always hearken back to the, uh, the evolutionary biology, the, the ancient natural history of the species, if you consider them all one species, all orcas or killer whales, I don't care, in the world. Because when you look at that, you really get a standard. You get a sort of a frame of reference to be able to compare life in captivity with that. And you just need to see that they uh, go way, way back. Six to ten million years as the largest of the dolphins, the largest brained of the dolphins, uh, able to filter out anywhere in the world, live in any habitat. And as far as we know, as far back as the genetic information will tell us, they have lived in these separate, discrete communities that are really extended families that develop their own way of life, their own, certainly, vocabulary, their own communication system, their own diets, their own uh, way of using their habitat, their own association patterns, their family structure, uh, everything about them is separate and determined by their, their social setting, their, their community that they grow up in. And that's their world. And physically, they travel uh, an average roughly of 100 miles a day, virtually every orca population around the world. And that means that it's 24-7. It's constantly on the move. Their entire bodies, all of their musculature goes to those flutes. So their natural way of being is to be constantly swimming. That's just what's normal and natural, and that's what maintains their metabolic health, their cardiovascular health, their their uh, respirations, uh, everything, their, their brain activity is all geared toward that kind of constant activity. So then when you contrast that with being confined in a, in a tight concrete box with other foreign whales or maybe a couple of generations of captive-born orcas, uh, it it's a completely different setting that is, it enforces immobility, for one thing, so that they don't get that kind of exercise that is really necessary to maintain their health. But it also, rather than having the kind of expression of their community lifestyle that they inherited and that they pass on to generations to come, they're dominated. Every move is really dominated by their setting and by their captors, by the trainers and, and whoever it is that uh, is, is running their lives. So they don't have the ability to make those choices about diet, about anything, about their social systems. They, they try, and, and I've seen sort of, you know, pathetic attempts at at forming into groups in captivity when there's more than one, uh, and swimming in this sort of patterned swimming that just bumps up against the wall every hundred feet or so to the you know edge of the tank, and it's just it's 
not at all comparable to the way they live out there. So it's no wonder that they their health deteriorates, their teeth go bad, that they become subject to opportunistic disease and infections. They get ulcers. They need to be heavily medicated for many different uh, illnesses as well as as psychological problems and, and mental and stress issues. So it's it's a constant battle just to keep them alive in captivity, even though they are so robust. Their evolutionary history has made them such strong animals overall. Uh, that's how they survive as long as they do in captivity, even though it's not very long in many cases. So how um, what's the typical age of a male and female orca to live in the wild? Uh, it's really hard to come to a, a simple average age that orcas live to in the wild because there are so many uh, sort of, you know, intervening variables and so much uh, flexibility, so much, uh, you know, differences in the different communities and, and the, the different individuals. But best indications are that in a, in a natural, normal population that the females could easily live into their 70s, 80s, or 100 or more and the males into their 50s, 60s, possibly 70s or more. In an undisturbed population, we just don't have one of those mm. that has been studied. The populations that have been studied are the most disturbed populations. So their rates are way down relative to normal orcas out in the wild. But those are the only data we have. So those are the ones that feed into the comparisons with captivity. Uh, that, for instance, SeaWorld is using now uh, in their recent paper. They're using the worst possible set of years data for wild populations to get some kind of parity with their data in captivity. I think I read an article at some point, though, that had, I think, did it have like a 103-year-old orca or something I read in the last couple of months? <laughs> That's right. Uh, J2 Granny, estimated to have been born in 1911. Wow. Uh, so that puts her at 104 this year. Uh, and that's an estimate. So you have to give or take a few years, but it could be more. I mean, she's doing pretty, uh, she's doing pretty well, though. <laughs> oh, and she's completely active. There's no way to tell by looking at her, her behavior. Uh, she's just as active. She breaches. She spy hops. She's out there in front most of the time. Uh, so, yeah, she's doing very, very well. It's only by statistical analysis that you can see that she must be roughly 100 years old. And does she go around with the rest of her family as well? She's always with her family. Uh, there, the association patterns show that she has more associations, more often seen with other whales than any other orca out there. She's always got her family around her. That's lovely to see. Yeah. There was a video recently uh, that SeaWorld um, released, and it was a day in the life of Tillicum um, to obviously try and publicise that he's all happy and okay. Um, but it was one of the, the most lonely, miserable videos um, that I've seen. And he was pulling around, well, he was sort of logging and then he was pulling around a piece of wood with some rope on it to try and, I don't know what that was trying to symbolise. Um, but an orca his age, what would he be doing in the wild at the moment? Would he, would he already have um, some of his family and stuff or would he, you know, what would he be doing? Right, it would be a, obviously a completely different life, much more vibrant, much more active, much more in tune with his world around him and, and responding to his family members and to the, the role that he plays, would have played if he had been allowed to grow up with his family uh, as a member of the family in their cooperative uh, feeding when they go after the herring. Uh, it could be the uh, the uh, the carousel feeding where they surround the school of fish and force them up to the surface and then take turns one at a time, goes in, grabs a few mouthfuls and comes back out and resumes their place in the circle to slap the fish, into, to compact them for the others. Uh, they're 
they're famous for their teamwork, for their ability to to uh, to take roles and to assist each other. They always share their food. Um, so he would be in that constantly uh, uh, sharing and and partaking, participating with his family kind of role uh, if he were still out in the wild where he was captured. It'd be a completely different life, much more fulfilling, I'm sure, than the utter boredom of being completely immobilized and, and just stuck in one place and maybe playing with a, you know, a rope toy or something that they give him. But uh, I'm sure that he loses interest in that after a minute or two anyway. As you say, that they um, they use teamwork a lot. I saw one of David Attenborough's um, documentary, and they have uh, a couple. There's a couple of orcas swimming alongside this mother uh, mink whale and her baby, and they they go for miles and miles, and they eventually separate them, um, and then they they take the the baby whale. Um, but they they were so persistent, but together, and they kept like wearing them down and everything. And they're so clever when they're hunting like that. It's fascinating to see. They're very methodical, very patient. Uh, they know where they're going and what their goal is, and and they may take time and even make a kind of a ritual out of it. It seems sometimes that if there's maybe it's a training session or just uh, sort of you know practicing going through the motions. Um, but it's fascinating to see, and it's all so deliberate. Every move is, is a, a conscious decision to do that thing right then and to be in complete communication with all the others. So they're all coordinating their activities at all times. It is amazing.